Hello and welcome to episode three of Music Learning Theory Presents. Today we are talking to Robert Baldwin, Hannah Mayo, and Sarah McCaffrey Ritchie about scheduling and policies for their Music Moves for Piano studios. Music Moves for Piano is an audiation-based method by Marilyn Lowe that applies Edwin Gordon's music learning theory to piano instruction. While Music Moves can be taught privately, it works extremely well with small groups of students. This makes scheduling and policies a bit different than the traditional 30, 45, or 60 minute lessons that are typically taught to one student at a time. I'm excited to learn how Robert, Hannah, and Sarah schedule their students and how they design their studio policies. We're also joined today by a few Music Moves for Piano teachers who I'm sure will be asking the questions that you might be thinking as you listen or watch. Before we dive into scheduling questions, I'm going to do some brief introductions. You may remember Hannah from episode one of Music Learning Academy Presents, where she spoke about transitioning her private studio to Music Moves for Piano. She currently teaches early childhood music classes and runs her piano studio in Louisiana. Welcome, Hannah. Hi, everybody. Also, if you've seen the video on my YouTube channel, of the keyboard games presentation from this summer's GIMO conference. You might recognize my fellow presenters, Robert Baldwin and Sarah Ritchie. Um, Robert teaches elementary general music classes and he runs his studio in North Carolina. Welcome, Robert. Honored to be here. And Sarah owns the music school Songs to Sarah in Minnesota, teaching early childhood music and music moves for piano classes. Hello, Sarah. Hello. So let's get started with some questions. Um, we're going to start with Hannah and we'll start talking about scheduling. So I want to know what was your process when you first started scheduling group lessons? Because this might be different for some of you. Some of you may have switched from a private studio into group lessons and other people may have just started from scratch, especially if they already knew keyboard games. What was your process like, Hannah? Um, I actually switched to group lessons before um, fully adopting the Music Moves method, and um, I was only using certain elements of MLT and Music Moves, um, but it was a really long process, but I knew um, it was important and it was something that I really wanted to do. So uh, I just took different kids and I looked at who I was teaching and who knew each other or who went to the same school and could potentially carpool, who was kind of the same level, similar personality types. And I sort of did like a full studio analysis of the kinds of students I was teaching. And for all the younger ones, I was able to get um, either at least a pair, sometimes three. And I had a couple of groups of four, which I ended up not loving. Three is kind of my magic number. Um, uh, for the groups that I had. Four is okay now that I have the Music Moves method. And I just um, sent a lot of emails and made a lot of phone calls and a lot of text messages and until it kind of all worked out. And um, I was teaching group lessons ever since. So was there, any, was there any pushback from the parents or were they all pretty accepting of the change? One or two of them, we tried group lessons and they were um the one kid was a really good practicer and one kid wasn't as good a practicer and so that kind of caused some problems in the lesson with one kid you know knowing exactly what was going on and the other being a little behind and the in that one case the mom requested that we go to a private lesson and because she wanted it to be like her own time and have all the attention and um i made that one exception because that was a particular kind of student um, but for the most part, no, everybody was pretty cool with it. They liked it. The kids really liked it. Um, they were sad whenever well, their partner wasn't there one day. Um, and the older students, though, stayed in private lessons. So if you were like eighth grade and older, seventh grade and older, you were um, still a private student. So what does your schedule look like now? Um, you have groups of students. Do they all come with their group and then you see the next group or are there overlapping groups? I have, uh, every day is completely different in my studio. Um, I have uh, some students, mostly really young ones who come at the same time and leave at the same time and they're there for 45 minutes to an hour. Um, then I have some groups where, like on Monday is a very interesting case. Uh, I have a set of siblings come at four o'clock 
and then another kid joins at 415 and then two more kids join at 445 and we do 15 minutes with six children and that's very interesting and then um, at five o'clock the first three leave and then at 515 the fourth one leaves and then it you know and it kind of just like overlaps and trickles in and out that way and then I have some that just come in pairs beginning to end they're there the whole time together and then I have some overlapping this mostly for older students where they'll do 30 minute individual lessons and then we'll have uh, 15 to 20 minute overlapping and then the first one will leave and the second one will have their individual lesson. And then I have just a few um, like advanced high school students that just have your traditional private lesson. This sounds very complicated. So, <laughs> it's <pretty> complicated. <laughs> um, so how long do you feel it takes you to schedule, say before September, to get all your students into a lesson time that you feel comfortable teaching? Um, I mean, it definitely takes some effort. I would not say that it's easy. Now that everything's kind of in place, it's a little bit easier. Um, but every year, you know, there's going to be some adjustments and you know, one kid might go be in this group and uh, just because everybody's schedule changes every year. So it's actually group lessons can be really advantageous, even though it takes a lot from you, you get a lot out of it because um, if a parent comes to you and says, I'm sorry, we just can't do Tuesday at four o'clock anymore. Um, I need another lesson time. Well, if I have a couple of other groups with the same age group and level, I can easily just move them over to a different day. So, so this brings me to my, to my next question. Um, your groups, we have so many overlapping. You said you had six kids at once. Are they all in the same book when you see them? Or do you have some, you also mentioned siblings. Do you have some classes and lessons that have different books at the same time? Yes. For the most part, they're relatively close in a book. Uh, but yeah, I have some siblings. Uh, one might be in book one and one might be still in keyboard games. And then I have some older students who were transfer students from my old way to my new way who have siblings who have grown up in music moves. And they're in the, like the older one is in the Keality book and using um, activities from books two and three. And the younger ones are in book one. And that's actually worked out really well because then the older, more advanced student can accompany for duets and they can deliver rhythm patterns and they can kind of learn to be the teacher themselves. So yes, I do have some groups are all kind of in the same area and then some groups are multi-level, but it works out. And I know you've been teaching uh, music moves for piano, you know, for just a couple years now, how much planning do you feel like it takes you when you have multiple books at the same time? Cause I know, um, <clears throat> sometimes, especially with siblings, it's easier to have them come at the same time. And for somebody that might be new to music moves, it might be a little intimidating. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Can you tell me the question one more time at the beginning? Yeah, just, <laughs> just the planning. The of planning. All right. Yeah, okay. Pretty yeah. much the planning. How do you go about, um, planning when you have two students or three students that might be in different places in the book? Um, I really plan it around uh, what are they going to do by themselves and what are they going to do together? And that, those are like the two big questions. And then as far as like acculturation and pattern play, of course, we're going to do all that together. But when it comes to actually playing the piano, that's really how I focus my planning is what is this kid doing by themselves and what are they going to be doing together? And that's kind of the formula that I follow when planning. That's excellent. Yeah, that's really good advice. And it really helps to kind of have that framework when approaching two different students in two different books. Um, let's move on to Robert. Robert, can you tell us a little bit about your um, process when you first started scheduling your group lessons? I'm assuming you started with private? Yes, I did start with private. So all one-on-one -on -one up to a couple of years ago, so I'm sort of coming at it from the standpoint that A, teachers are like chronically underpaid and, um, and chronically don't produce enough value generally because, I mean, if piano teachers were more effective, there would be a lot more adults who played piano. But most of the adults that I talked to who took piano when they were kids feel like they failed at it. So 
I don't know. I play Nintendo. I used to buy video games, and they're like sixty dollars. They come in a box. Uh, then I started downloading the games, and they still cost sixty dollars. You know, so I was thinking about that. I mean, it doesn't cost them any money to uh, stream a game for people to download. Uh, so it should be cheaper, right? But no, it's not cheaper uh, because the value to the person playing the game is the same. So I, f I figure, so for years, um, trying to address the underpaid issue, I've been trying to find a way to make more money when parents aren't going to pay more money. And the only way I could think to do it would be to have more students at the same time. And a lot of, it seems like a, the one way people do that is to have lessons where kids put their headphones on and they're all like taking the same lesson at the same time. Mm. Uh, so I figure that's not really group lessons. That's uh, four kids taking their lesson concurrently. And that wasn't appealing to me. I didn't feel like it would be useful. Uh, I've also had group therapy before. I don't know if y'all have ever been to group therapy but it's messy and it's very effective. Like the learning happens through the messiness of it. Anyway, so I found out about music learning theory and music moves uh, on the Art of Piano Pedagogy Facebook page. And I did a lot of reading about it before I started implementing it, but just everything Edwin Gordon wrote in learning sequences in music it's really dense, and I know some people have to read it over and over again but before it makes sense, but my first reading, so much of it was just click. Um, so I immediately recognized, well, I can teach using this stuff, and the kids are going to be learning more than they did when they were learning by themselves. Uh, so I'm not going to charge them less if they're learning more. So anyway. What was the question about scheduling and stuff? <laughs> Everybody, yeah. Robert. Um, no, yes, I just wanted to know your process. So I actually didn't know process. that you were thinking about group piano lessons before you even came across music learning theory and music moves for piano. So yeah, um, for six or seven years, I was thinking there's got to be a way to do this that benefits kids. Uh, but every way that I saw to do it was lesser. Like I could do a group lesson, but the kids are really going to be learning less. Um, so yeah, when, when I saw music learning theory, it just, it clicked. Like this is what people need. This is like how people learn language. Mm -hmm. Like how could someone learn to speak a language fluently just by sitting with an adult for an hour every week? It's, it's kind of stupid. Or even less because a lot of times the private lessons are 30 a lot less time. And with right. group, uh, the, the, the least amount that I do is the minimum time would be 45 minutes, 50 minutes. So they get a, so lot, more, is, a lot more time, uh, a lot more instruction, and they're acculturating the whole time, even if they're not playing. And there's this law in computing that data doesn't really exist unless it exists in two or more places. Because if your data is on one place, in one place and that place gets destroyed for whatever reason, it's gone. But I find that learning in children doesn't really exist unless it's happening with two or more kids. I mean, in, in private lessons, I find myself saying the same things week after week after week to every student. But when they're learning and interacting with each other, wow, it just really locks it in. Absolutely. And so what does your schedule look like? Do you have students that come in groups together and then leave? Are they overlapping? Um, are, they in, are they even in the same books or different books? Seems like at this point it's kind of gravitated towards lots of uh, overlapping. Mm -hmm. So some siblings will come at the same time and leave at the same time, but other than that most days have some overlapping. I mean I just got tired of parents like to make their problems my problem and I don't like that so you know if a parent says they can only come at this time now I'm like 
fine. Just bring them at that time. And, and I'll just have to think of something that, that they can do. But there's so much that they can do with music learning theory. I mean, and so no, they're not all in the same books. They're in varying books. Um, but if they understand how to play a simple accompaniment with macro beats or micro beats while the other kid is doing the other thing, um, we come up with really interesting stuff. So every lesson has interesting music I've never been particularly interested in the music my students played before. I mean, how many, I mean, I like the gumdrop factory in the Faber books, but come on. But now every lesson has music that nobody has ever played before and nobody will ever play again. And it sounds cool. So yeah, so they're not all in the same books now. And there's a lot of overlapping just because practically that's the only way that I can make the logistics work. So now I'm just running with it. Yeah. I, I don't know about you, but I found um, our, our music school does it a little bit different. We are very like group oriented, you know, a book 2A here, a book 1A here. But I found some of my best ideas have come when I overlap the groups and just mm -hmm. work out, almost outside of the books. Like Hannah said, mm -hmm. what are we going to do together? What are we going to do? Um, apart when they're in their own lessons. And I think that overlapping is, is really fun, and really important for both the teacher and for, you know, pushes us out of our comfort zone a little bit to go away from the books and really um, rely on our knowledge of music learning theory. But I think it is important and, and fun. knowledge of music, because yeah. musicians improvise. It's like that John Lennon quote, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. Well, the best learning is what's happening when we're doing something that wasn't on our schedule. Absolutely. Thank you, Robert. Um, Sarah, now you have a little bit different, you have a music school. And how do you go about scheduling your um, music moves for piano classes? Well, this is my first year of having it be more of a school. I do, I hired another teacher. Um, so, uh, it's really not that different. She just, we schedule her things a little bit separately. We do actually overlap. We're trying for the first time having her keyboard games classes because that's what I hired her to do. Overlap with my big kids. And then I remove my children. Like we have a big space and we do all of our movement and, and music and acculturation things. And then I take for the next 45 minutes, I take my book one students out or my book two students, or in one case, they're, they're book three students. And um, so that's kind of a new experiment is overlapping with two teachers. It's really fun. It's really that sounds, fun. That yeah. sounds amazing. And how long do your students- and The little kids are obsessed because, especially when you have, you know, the eight-year-olds who are in book three and the five-year-olds, one of whom happens to be one of my, my own kid. Um, because the big kids, while we're, what, whatever they're doing, whatever keyboard game song they're doing, I just am leading the big kids. And so if the, they're moving with flow, maybe my kids are just tapping the due days. And so we're kind of taking all of our book three acculturation things. We're not doing the songs necessarily that Marilyn has put into the lesson plans. We're missing out on that a little bit, but we'll kind of mix them in here and there. And it's, it's a really cool experience. Sometimes we have like six or seven kids in the room. Um, moving around like, you know, octopuses, octopuses, o octopi, Pi? octopi, <laughs> octopodes, <laughs> so Octo <it's> octopode, <laughs> is it really? oh, I don't know, octopode, Greek. Stephanie, is, Stephanie would like to know the current sizes of everyone's studio or program, so Hannah, how many students do you have in your Music Moves for Piano program now? Um, I have in my private studio, which is the after school hours, I have about 38 right now. And I have three in preschool. Um, I teach at a preschool uh, in the morning and I have a group of three that I teach a piano class to. Excellent. Robert, how many do you have? It's very humbling to be amongst you three. Um, I have about 16 at this point. And, and maybe a couple of those are individual just because of logistics, but most of those are overlaps or siblings or that kind of thing. Nice. And Sarah, how many are in your program? Uh, we are at 61. We have 61 students. I know. I would love to hire another teacher, peeps out there. 
<laughs> uh, and a wait list, a wait list of almost 12 students. So we have found the same thing at um, our school, Brookline Music School, is that when you hire more teachers, um, your wait list is just going to grow. <laughs> yeah. I think we're about at, and retention is really good. So we're at about 130 maybe students now. Yes. It grows really, really fast. It yep. grew fast in the beginning and a lot of kids have stayed, um, which is wonderful, which is amazing. And then I have another question regarding scheduling. Um, when you have a new student that comes into your studio, where do you place them? So Hannah, what's your process for placing a new student into one of the classes? Um, this happened uh, this year, actually. I got um, a batch of new kids and it all sort of worked out that um, I think, you know, the there's like this guiding hand or something happening over my studio that helps me work it out but all of the students that came in were um a match with some existing student or group of students and um, i had a couple of them that moved away this year so i lost some students but um the ones that came in matched the ones that got left by their partner or their you know and then I had two new ones who were both uh, transfer students and they came, I had no room for them really, um, except on Friday and nobody ever wants to take the Friday spot, but it is there. And so now somebody finally wanted to take the Friday spot because it was the only one available. And um, at this point, I don't think that I could fit much anybody else in. I could try, but I think at this point I could not take any more students, but I've been really fortunate that the students that come in or have come in in the last year just sort of fit somewhere. And on, like, I won't even have the first lesson interview, trial lesson, whatever you want to call it, um, unless, they're, unless they can commit to the time that I'm giving them. So, you know, if the only spot I have for you is Wednesday at five o'clock, for example, then um, and you can do Wednesday at five o'clock then they would come and do an observation and participate if they were ready to participate uh, but it's like magic I don't really know how to explain it I just find a place for them if I can and if I can't I refer them to some other community teachers that's about it <laughs> so do you meet them before you place them or do you place them based on age or maybe prior music experience I um, I ask some questions to the parents, you know, like how old do they have any background? Are they um, are they do they show signs of loving music? Do they take have they taken piano lessons before with a previous teacher? I ask them those kinds of questions, and then um, based on their answers, if I have a place for them potentially, I will say, okay, I would like to invite you on Wednesday at five o'clock to come and observe this lesson and um, participate with a few of the activities and then I observe how that goes and I tell the parents like this is a trial we're going to see how it goes we're going to see how the kids get along we're going to see how I get along with the students and how they get along with me and then if everything seems great we'll uh, move forward and if not we will move forward in a different direction that may or may not mean uh, finding another teacher yeah and Robert, what about you when you get a new student? When I get a new student, um, I mean, I'm going to want to meet with them before I try to place them anywhere. Um, but, you know, I just try to do things that, that are going to be the least effort for me. Uh, I figure I just want it to be like a little commune. <laughs> uh, so I guess what I'm headed towards is like revolving door of lesson days because I always kind of felt like you know as a rookie teacher one of the first things I, I want to talk about is ooh, is your kid ready to go from a 30 minute lesson to a 45 minute lesson oh now they're ready for an hour and now I just think that doesn't mean anything I, like with an open door you know kids can stay longer I had some, some kids yesterday that are, that are teenagers they've been taken for a while and now they're here for like 90 minutes oh wow some of it's overlapping and it's just fun i like that i also have a new thing i'm working on 
two hours on Sunday afternoon uh, for kids in the community who want to maybe take like one lesson occasionally. Because I'm thinking sometimes a kid wants to learn how to play a piece, but they don't want to sign up for weekly lessons. So and I think in the future, that might be like a feeding ground for the regular weekly lessons. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. It's just a pilot thing. But um, yeah, basically, I think if my waiting list is too big, I need to charge more. That's the way I look at that. Anyway, did that answer the question? Yes, thank you. And Sarah, okay. what about you? If you get a new student, do you place them right away or do you meet them beforehand? Um, it depends on, on the situation. Like over the summer, I, I picked up a couple of, of new people. Um, I met with their parents, I asked them questions, and I, I just did my best to, to fit them where I thought they would schedule-wise and also ability-wise. But uh, I, one in particular, it's, it's going well, but I do have two five-year-olds because they're the younger siblings and then a book two and then I started this seven-year-old in kind of a book one keyboard games B combination. So essentially I have three different levels that I'm trying to teach you and I've, I think this is, this is great and so I, I'm telling you this because I feel like scheduling people shouldn't be such an issue with a new student. What you need to do as a teacher is get really skilled at teaching different levels. And after, God, the sun is just like, <laughs> the sun is like risen and the light of God is shining on me all of a sudden. Um, and it's really bright. Um, <laughs> the spotlight. Uh, but yeah, I feel like with scheduling a new student, it's really about your ability as a teacher to place them and to be able to teach to all of the different levels. Um, I have a lot of like, you know, I have a really big bag of tricks and I have uh, you know, an 88 key digital piano with headphones. So I, I can just sort of send people around. We do our acculturation and then you just get them all doing their activities and moving around and like stations, if you want to say it that way. But so now at this point in my career, I feel like I could start someone at any level and put them anywhere. Um, it's, it's a matter, I mean, yes, it is really lovely when like a book two class that's all on unit three is all standing in your room and you're doing the duplicate meter song you're like wow this is great you're all at the exact same level but that's so rare because even if you have a book two class the chances of them all being at the same level is so incredibly like unlikely so um i i don't know now starting a new student is sort of a challenge and it's fun and i just get parents to understand that it's not about the age it's not about the ability it's that they're here for an hour or 75 minutes um to to basically create music and whatever i don't even call myself a piano teacher and i'm really careful about that I, I say these are music classes that have the piano involved in them so you're learning the piano but mostly you're learning how to be a musician there's the light of god again <laughs> well it must have been this? a wonderful answer um, yeah. i win no <laughs> oh my god <laughs> I need to move. <laughs> oh, so my attendees, if you have any questions about scheduling, we're going to wrap up the scheduling part of our talk um, and move on to studio policies. Um, but before we move on, I just want to ask my panelists one last question in regards to scheduling. And what do you feel? If you could pick one thing that you feel has been working really well for you, what would that one thing be? Hannah. Um, there's a greater sense of community you know, the, these uh, kids that have been uh, partnered up and um, in groups for the last couple of years, they are really good friends and they play together at every lesson. And sometimes I find myself just backing up and like, it's like, I'm not even there and they just start doing their own thing or especially when we do um, creative things and, they just sort of take over their own lesson. And that's probably like when my heart just wants to burst is when I can just sit back and they just play music. That's been like the, the huge thing about group lessons and it's yeah. worth all of the work and um, uh, tedious planning that goes along with it sometimes. Yeah. Excellent. Robert, what would your one thing be that works really well when you're scheduling group lessons? Improvisation, 
for similar reasons just because it's so much fun and we're making music that's never been made before and that's when they're really learning and seems to work really well excellent i had another thought but it's gone now i'm sorry okay. if it comes back let me know um okay. sarah with you with scheduling i feel like you kind of just answered this question too with your overlapping and your different different students and your classes but what would you define as your one thing that works really well with your students? can i clarify the question are you asking specifically with scheduling or the one thing that's working well in my group classes as as a as a teacher so it kind of turned into <laughs> yeah i goof i goof which is perfect i, I like it well i, I mean poorly <laughs> that's, that's quite all right um what is one thing that works the original question was scheduling what do you think works really well um with scheduling um with scheduling specifically i i don't i don't know if i have a very good answer for this i i know hannah right off the bat said that it's really difficult to schedule i mean the be i'm in july when i'm sitting at my computer trying to basically put a giant puzzle piece together it's very challenging. I think there's, there's again, um, I, I think that like the thing that works well for me is just doing it. Like that, that's what's working well for me is taking that time to schedule the groups. And I think that I, I'm assuming that people who are teaching individual students might actually look at that and, you know, hear Robert say, it's gonna make me more money and that sounds great but like that sounds like a big nightmare but you know the nightmare ends really quickly and then the dream comes out and it's it's so my what's working for me is doing it period is scheduling the group classes um and i'm not rolling around in my room full of money yes i'm making more money than if i was you know one-on-one -on -one for 30 minutes but I, I don't I don't really care about that. What I what's happening is is what everyone has said. The magic in the room is happening. The improv is happening. So the nightmare of scheduling is just a thousand percent worth it. So that that's it. What's working for me is doing this. Period. Is taking the time and the effort and dealing with the, the chaos. It's chaotic, but that's music, man. Music is not one person playing an instrument. It it just it never. I don't know, like a solo album that comes out, that's great, but we have more musicians involved. That's, that's, that's what music is. So this is, this is it, it's just worth it, just do it. And we have a question from Dreama. Um, when you meet new parents and their students, how do you explain to them that lessons may not be a set 45 minute, but they may be overlapping with other kids and other groups? Um, and that sometimes, even before scheduling, you're not really sure what they may get yet until the schedule is set for the year. So kind of, parents do need to be a little bit flexible. You're not putting them, you know, you can't guarantee, well, we're gonna have a half an hour at this time and that's it. It kind of all depends on these schedule, these overlaps and these groups. So how do you explain that? I guess not really, it's like an uncertainty of what they're, what they're getting into. How do you explain that to parents? Hannah. Um, I don't do a lot of explaining about that. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's like there, there's so many other questions that they have, but sometimes that's the case. Like how long is the lesson? You get that question sometimes. And I, um, I, it's, it is flexible, but the simple answer is everyone comes to my house for a minimum of 45 minutes. If you're in a pair, you might be here 45 minutes to an hour. If you're in a group that's three or more, you will be here minimum one hour and probably a little bit longer. And that seems to be okay for them. And I did want to say um, about this kind of piggybacks on what Sarah said and also answers the question a little better when I took it. I answered a different question last time, but um, I wanted to say, yeah, it is a big puzzle and it's very challenging, but it only lasts for a minute. And the other thing that is working well is the flexibility. The flexibility is really another piece of the puzzle. And like, for example, I have a kid who is doing flag football, but only for a couple of months. And so he doesn't want to just stop taking piano for those couple of months. Well, it just so happens that I've got a group of kids who are just a year older 
who have been playing all the same songs that he just finished or that they finished what he is now starting. And so they're at the point where they can go back and review um, some things yeah. and add more interesting duet parts. And they are covering their review while the younger boy is there um, learning these songs for the first time. And then at the end of October, when he goes back to his other group, he's, he hasn't lost any ground. He's going to be right there with his old group. And so like the flexibility is really the thing that works so well. Just wanted to add that. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and Robert, how do you explain the time, I guess, commitment or the uncertainty of how long they will be there if it's not set 30, 45, 60 minute lessons? I think I'm usually pretty clear and say specifically that I don't want this to be about the lesson time. I mean, I feel like if I'm looking, you know, I think we probably already taught, always taught lessons where the students are looking at the clock and that's not a good sign. And I've taught lessons where I'm looking at the clock and that's not a good sign either. Um, I, I have a little bit of a, a price difference between like the youngest kids, fours and fives that I think are maybe gonna only go for 45 minutes max. Uh, but once they get eight or so, pretty much everybody's doing at least an hour. And so there's a kind of a different rate for that, but I don't like to make it too much about all that. So back to the previous question, the one thing that I has made things easier scheduling is just throwing my hands up in the air and saying, you know, if the parent says they can only come at this time during the week, fine, we'll do that. We'll make it work. Excellent. And Sarah, how do you explain um, times to your parents? Uh, I, I don't really. I just I sort of tell them that I'll, I'll let them know. Um, I at the, at the end of the year, I email all of my clients and I say, just give me your fall times that you want and that you're hoping for and I will do my best. I don't know whether your child will have a 60 minute or a 75 minute. Um, I honestly, they, they just sort of defer to me and I, I rarely have someone who's like, this is the only time I can do. Um, I think a lot of my families are pretty committed. Um, I know we haven't gotten to policies yet, but one of my, one of my things in my policies is like, do not schedule anything over your lesson. This is like, once you get your time, this is the most important thing. Like, I, I don't know. I'm kind of, kind of a little bit of a brat about it. <laughs> like just, I, I got this, you'll be fine. I'll let you know uh, how much you owe me. If, if a parent is like, I can't afford to do 75 minutes and I can only do 60. Um, sometimes I, I'll just be like, just pay for the 60 and they can stay or not. And I don't know, I, I try to be, uh, I don't think that's a problem. I, I just, I don't know, it's not, it's not a question that my parents have for me. They're just like, what are we doing? And then I tell them and they go, cool. So. Sounds yeah. good. All right, so can we I add one oh, more thing to that. Yes, of course. I think it's really important what she said. Um, once you start doing this for a couple of years and the kids are making really great music and they're having so much fun and it's obvious that they're developing these really um, internal confidence and the, their rewards are coming from an internal place and they're joyfully making music and it's not this like pressure situation. Once they see that for two years, they're not going to care. Like they, they, that's when they start to trust you and they refer to your decision making about lesson times and how much it costs. And at that point, you know, the, the process, which is the music learning theory process and the music moves process has really done its job. And then you just get to be the teacher and not have to feel those kinds of questions as much. Just wanted to add that because that was a really good point. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Yeah. Um, so let's move on to studio policies because these also might be, have some differences with if they, you know, were just private lessons. Um, some not though. Uh, calendar though, do you guys have um, a set calendar for the year? Do you teach in, I guess this is kind of a three part question. Um, first part, do you teach in terms or is it full year? Um, the second part, do you have teaching days and non-teaching days designated within that year? Um, and then the third part would be, do you have designated makeup days? So we'll take this one at a time. I'm going to start backwards this time. Um, so Sarah, um, do you teach in terms? 
Uh, I teach a September through May calendar, and then I offer like a sprinkling of summer lessons. Um, they, they're usually like one-on-one -on -one or like a really large group would all come together. It's so it's, I really focus on the school year. Okay. And you're going to have to remind me what the next questions are. That's fine. I figured I would. Um, do you have teaching and non-teaching days set ahead of time? What does that mean? Um, <laughs> So like, do I take like, days off? <laughs> yeah, I mean, our school is closed for when, say, um, the public schools are closed. Okay, yeah. So I usually go with the Minneapolis Public School um, with some varying things. Like if they have a parent-teacher conference day kind of thing, I'm usually like, yeah, you're coming to piano that day. Um, but for example, Minnesota has a Wednesday through Friday coming up that's off. And so I'm not teaching because so many families – head up to the cabin one last time before the lake freezes over. And I, I know, you know, it's, it's all depends on where you live, but, but yeah, I, I have a calendar. I put it out there. I use my music staff for my families um, so they can view their calendar. They know I remind them when classes are canceled, but usually it's about 32 lessons or classes a year. Okay. And then you okay. asked about makeup policy and I've gotten really I've become really strict about that. Actually, if I am absent, then you will either be reimbursed or I will provide a makeup for your child. And that could be a variety of things. It could be me coming in on a Saturday morning and just doing some one-on-one -on -one and scheduling them that way. Or if I'm really unable to do a makeup, then if it's my absence, I will somehow reimburse them or prorate their tuition for the next month. But my snow policy, because I live in Minneapolis and because last year, I think the Minneapolis public schools were closed down for at least like eight snow days and cold weather days. I do not make up snow days. This is where we live. I'm sorry if our, if I have to cancel because of snow, then uh, one thing I might do is I might just put like one extra week on the end of the year and have that just be like an overall encompassing, like, all right, you know, it's snowed 14 inches of snow snow that one day or it was 45 below zero and we didn't have class for three days so I might have just like a big old party here that last week and have like 10 different kids come in here and just do all these different activities like that's my makeup for like all the days but I can't control the weather and the weather shouldn't make me as an educator and a good educator not be able to eat so I become really strict with my snow policy and it feels good that was really stressful last year. Like, like tears at home. How are we going to make ends meet? And now I have to make up all these classes and childcare. And I have three kids of my own. And I just finally was like, screw this. It's not my problem. If someone doesn't like it, then they should probably go to a music school that can afford to provide them all the makeups that they need. But I, I can't. I'm just me. So. Right. And coming from another very snowy area where we had 72 inches of snow a couple of years ago. Um, our community music school does do one snow makeup, mm -hmm. but none after nice. that. Yeah. <laughs> I guess one um, is nice. I, I can, I can be nice, but it's, it's the, uh, and I teach music play classes too. And it was just, I'm renting that space hourly and I have to pay for it whether we have class or not. So I just have to be, I have to take care of myself too. And yeah. Which is important to remember. Yes. Yes. Um, Robert, so quickly, what are your calendar? Do you set a calendar ahead of time? Do you have days that are non-teaching days? Do you teach September through June, September through May? You didn't tell Sarah quickly. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, 31 lessons from September to May. Okay. Um, Perfect. So that gives me about five or six days off per student. Um, and I published the calendar uh, by the beginning of September. So we have little days off sprinkled throughout, which just allows me to be human. I think the stuff that Sarah was saying about taking care of ourselves, we have to do that. And that's so important. And the way I look at it is, you know, what if one of my students did this job in the future? I want them to do well. And I also want them to have a nice life. And if I don't figure out how to make that work in my studio, how could they do it for them? Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, charging more money, I mean, that's part of it. And it's not just for me, it's for the community. 
and I ain't getting rich, but it's important that we're not struggling. I can't teach my best when I'm struggling and I still have those weeks. Um, but I have to try to put things into place so that it's not like that. Anyway, th the 31 days thing, that also feeds into the uh, makeups because if I have some bad weather days, I can usually take one of those days that had been scheduled as a day off in April or something, and well, we'll just teach on that day instead of have it as a day off. Um, so that kind of takes care of itself. Um, if a kid misses a lesson, I used to be a hardliner about no makeups, and that worked for me then, but now that I'm doing groups and overlaps, I'll just tell them to come on a different day that week when they get better. Um, one new thing for me is to re require students to take at least three lessons in the summer, because um, I've, I've quit my backup job, my church job, um, so I need some income over the summer, mm -hmm. so that's how I'm doing that. Thanks. Did that answer the questions yes. quickly? Yes, thank you. And you just okay. you bring up a really important point, and I'm glad this came up, um, that you do need to take care of yourself. And um, it's really easy, I think, especially when just starting out to want to please everyone. And, you know, if a student misses a, a lesson because they have a cold or they're sick and, you know, you want the parent to be happy and say, okay, I'll, I'll go out of my way and do so, so, and so. And um, that only can last for so long before you just get tired. So can I, think I say something? Yeah. Um, also as, as a parent, they, they don't, they really don't have time to make up a lesson and come a different time. So I, I don't know. I find that most parents are like, fine, but what Robert said was, was great. Like, yeah, or I think it was Robert come on, come a different day. I do. I do that. I'll say like, look, I do have a class of two kids on Thursdays at four your kid would fit in perfectly with that. So with makeups, I do, I do sort of like put out an offer like, well, we could do this. And if they say no, then that's it. We've, we've done it. I'm not doing any more work, but also parents are busy. Like my kid, when she misses her violin, I, she, her teacher might be like, well, do you want to try makeup? I'm like, nope, I don't have time. We don't, we're too busy. And most, most parents and most kids are too busy to do a makeup anyway. So mm -hmm. I don't know. And Take yeah, our community music school, actually, if a student misses a group class, there are no makeups. Mm -hmm. So if I miss, yeah. we schedule a makeup during one of the makeup weeks. Um, also, as I mentioned before, there's one snow day that will make up. But if a student misses one of the group classes, then there is no makeup for that student. The other things 31 lessons a, a year does for me is uh, it takes care of sick days for me. So if I'm sick, I can put them in a later day off. And it also takes care of all this Monday federal holidays where the Monday students aren't going to mm -hmm. come. Well, fine. Yep. I'll just schedule them off. And they're, but it still equalizes with the other students. Yeah. Yeah. The Mondays, there are a lot of holidays. We have that as well. Um, right. Hannah, can you tell us about your calendar and your makeup policy? Um, I've been through all the evolutions of makeup policy, I think. There was a time when I was like, no makeups ever. And then there was a time where I would um, make up, but I didn't have set days, but I was trying to like fit them into my already very busy schedule. That wasn't really working. Uh, so now what I do is on holiday weeks, this is probably echoes what Robert was saying. Um, on weeks that we're already having a holiday break, I will take one or two of those days, sometimes three, but more like one or two, and have a makeup day. That way I still get some holiday and some break time, um, but they still have the opportunity to get a makeup. And then what Sarah said was really true. I have a lot of parents who's like, oh, we missed, we don't care. We just missed a lesson and we're not going to have a makeup. We're not going to worry about all that. But um, it's really easy to just say, these are the makeup days on the calendar at the beginning of the year. And I do a full year calendar where it's um, fall semester, spring semester, summer semester. And then it, it, it echoes the school calendar. Um, I take a couple of more breaks than the school calendar does, but for the most part, it kind of goes along with the uh, Lafayette Parish school ca school calendar. Um, so the other thing about it is that I often uh, 
work makeups into my schedule based on what I'm already doing. So if I am in work mode one week, like I teach at the university where we don't get a full week for Thanksgiving, we only get two days off, but the school system gets a whole week. Well, that week I'm already in work mode anyway, so I might as well teach some makeup lessons before Thanksgiving. And then on Thursday and Friday, I can chill. And the, and the same thing is true for Mardi Gras. Y'all don't have that. We have that. Um, but Mardi Gras is a three-day holiday, but it doesn't make any sense to just have three days off. You take the whole week off, but then you can have some days off and some days for makeup. So um, it, that's worked out just to kind of put makeup weeks um, in line with the holiday weeks and just kind of do a half and half holiday makeup thing. But um, I do sort of lean on the fact that a lot of parents either forget or they don't care or they're not worried about it. And then all I do um, right before we're about to have some makeup, like we have a bunch of makeup time in October. And now that we're in October, I just send out one of those um, sign up genius emails. If you're familiar with that platform and there's others like it. And I just put all the days that I'm going to do makeups and the times and um, it's 45 minutes a piece. And that is the one time that younger kids have a private lesson. And so, you know, they're like, where's my friend? But at the same time, they're like, Oh, this is fun too. And they kind of have like that one-on-one -on -one time with me, which is, you know, nice every once in a while. And it kind of gives me an opportunity to focus on them because the ones that actually take the makeup are the more serious ones anyway. And so they come in and they're ready to do a bunch of stuff. And the ones that don't take the makeup, you know, that's fine too. So that's how I handle makeup lessons. Excellent. And Andrea just added too. She said that's true. When she had a studio of 35 to 40 students' parents, she offered a swap list, but mostly parents were fine with just missing the lesson and didn't expect a refund. Um, and now Dreama asks, for snow days, does anyone offer online lessons as an option um, that's at the same time as their original lesson time? And I don't know if this would be for our North Carolina or Louisiana folk. Um, <laughs> well, we so have flood days. Oh, flood we, days. Yeah, we often experience um, very intense flooding, uh, and especially like at the end of the summer. And I mean, there was a time where we were out for like, you know, people could move around for a week. Um, so we do have some weather issues and we have hurricane season that often, you know, shuts down the, uh, the state. But so we, we have a different kind of a snow day. <laughs> so have you ever offered yeah. online lessons or no? Yeah, I do FaceTime lessons, but um, they have to be a certain age, I think. Um, I, I, ha I can't do FaceTime lessons with small children. So I do some FaceTime lessons with um, anybody who's like eight or older and in at least book one and, and knows what to expect from me and knows the process. Like I probably wouldn't do a FaceTime lesson with a student who just started, you know, a month ago. But uh, yeah, and I have some students that moved away couldn't find a teacher that they like and they do FaceTime lessons with me from uh, Tennessee and other states. Nice. And Sarah, do you offer any kind of online lesson if there's a snow day or? I, I don't. My, my students are, are all like younger than like eight and nine. I think my oldest student is is nine. And I just don't, I don't think they could do it. First of all, they would need so much parent support. And I, I don't think, I mean, I, I've never even really thought about it. I have at one point there was a blizzard and I was actually stuck here. I couldn't leave, but nobody could get to me either. And so I just made videos for each student. I just sat at my piano and I, I sent it to them. And then I made the mistake of looking at YouTube and saw that like most of them had zero views. And I was like, screw that. I'm never doing that again. <laughs> like, I actually put a lot of time into like giving little like Sorry, you can't come because there's snow. Here's what I want you to do at home. And like parents didn't even watch it. So like, forget that. Go build a snowman. Go play. Um, <laughs> really, go play. Snowing outside. Um, okay, so we covered <laughs> calendar. We covered absences. Um, what about tuition? So I have a couple questions about tuition. You don't have to tell us how much your tuition is, but... Um, if you have, what are their payment options? Are your students paying for the year? Are they paying monthly? Are they paying per lesson? Um, do you have any registration fees or event fees? What happens if a student wants to withdraw from the lessons or wants a refund? And then the last one is, 
um, do you offer any discounts? Um, so I'm going to start with Robert this time. Robert, how do your students pay by month, by year? Uh, I'll go ahead and say my rate is 210 bucks a month for uh, that's kind of the basic rate that everybody pays for the very young kids. It's 160 bucks a month. Um, and I make parents aware, of course, first that it's that's for 31 lessons over the course of the year. So then that keeps my monthly income steady, which I find helpful. Um, so that's that. What were the other question parts? Yeah, I'll go through them. Um, are there any registration fees for new students or event fees or anything? Um, no. Okay. Are there, what happens if a student wants to withdraw? Do they have to give you like 30 days notice or only certain times a year? I, I used to have that and I think it's reasonable for teachers to do that. Uh, at this point, it doesn't seem to be so much of an issue. I mean, with me only being kind of month to month with no long-term contract, my exposure really isn't very high. Uh, I had somebody who wanted a refund of a hundred bucks a couple of years ago. And at that point, I'm just going to give them a hundred bucks rather than fight. I don't want to fight about it. Um, but, but generally, uh, I just, uh, they do seem to just let me know ahead of time. Yeah. Um, do you offer discounts for any reasons for siblings or you said your keyboard mm -hmm. games is a little bit cheaper monthly than older students. Yeah, but that's, that's the only thing I, I used to do some sibling discounts but then i figured uh this one kid is i'm getting less income for him even though i'm working as hard for for them or her um and then and then and then i kind of resented that because i thought you know if i got another student that wasn't a sibling i could put them in the same slot and then i'd be making more so i figured you know why really how am i really helping them by providing a discount as opposed to making my studio function in a way that works for me because it is a business and if it's not working for me it's not going to work for anybody mm -hmm. and in um, that monthly fee do you include books um stephanie wants to know or are parents buying the books themselves how does that work uh i'm sort of come from the uh kind of upper level suburb of raleigh north carolina so people kind of have some money. Uh, so I just let them know ahead of time that books are extra. So that might be 20 to $50 on a particular month. If it's going to be a expensive month, like if I know a student has a lot of new books coming up, I'll let them know ahead of time. But other than that, just expect that there might be 20 or $30 extra on the bill. I, I'm not making any profit off it. I usually tell them that. And so you they, purchase they usually you purchase the box and then add it to their bill. Yes, mm -hmm. it saves me the headache of them getting the wrong book and it saves them the headache of finding what I, I'm wanting them to get. Right, yeah. Um, so we'll go to Sarah next. Sarah, um, payment options, so do you month by month? Or uh, a lot of it, a lot of it is the same. Um, I don't charge as much as Robert, but also like Minneapolis is a different place. Um, and I don't have his expertise. I'm, I'm not a, I don't have degrees in piano performance. I'm an early childhood music educator. So, but anyways, don't say anything, Robert. Um, <laughs> I charge monthly. Um, I won't say my rate. You can look it up or email me if you're super curious. Um, but I charge monthly. Some people pay for the full year, it's a very specific parent that wants to do that. And of course I will allow that. Um, I do not have a policy in place for canceling and I kind of think I should. Um, I did have a family move and it was unexpected, but it, it just threw off. I mean, they moved on like September 1st and I got an email saying like, oops, we're not gonna be in piano anymore. And it really, it, it, it was scrambling because then I had one kid left in the class. So um, I do think I need to form a policy around that. I had another kid that, that just, her parents were like, this isn't right for us, which happens with music learning theory um, and, and depending on their expectations. And that happened just this week. Uh, I was able to fill the class right away, so, or fill the, the spot right away. So I was like, well, I'm also not going to raise any stink about that. I kind of feel like Robert. It's like, you know what? If you really, if it's not for you, 
I don't want to fight. I just don't, I don't feel like fighting. And if it happened many, many times, then I would have to look at myself and why it's happening. So, cause that's probably on me then if people are just leaving. Um, uh, what were some of the other questions? Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Do I don't you have, have I don't, I don't have a recital fee. And I know some people do. I kind of just lump that into my, my monthly. Like your monthly tuition is not just for your class. It's for the recitals. It's for the extra time. It's for me sending you notes through my music staff, blah, blah, blah. Um, and discounts. I did offer sibling discounts. And I no longer do for new clients. So I emailed my former clients. I said, look, I don't want your rate to just like whoosh go up. Even though it's like, it's like 10% off, right? Like it's really not a huge uh, thing, but now I'm calling that my loyalty discount. So now my, my former clients who have two kids and they are still receiving the loyalty discount, but that does not exist in the form of a sibling discount anymore. Um, however, I have a family that has two children in music moves for piano. They're paying full rate for both of them. They're brand new and their child comes to my music play classes where they're also having a, a you know, a 10 week tuition. So I, I do give, I give them a discount on their music play. So if they have a kid, two children in piano and they're bringing a kid to my music classes, I'm just like, that is so, I don't know. I have three kids. I know from the parent perspective, that's a lot of money that's a lot of support they're giving my business. And so I do give them, and I still call it a loyalty discount because I'm not going to call it a sibling discount. You're just, thank you for being so loyal that you're registering your entire freaking family into my music school when you have boatloads of options around here. So like, thank you. Here's a little discount. You're providing a lot of value to them though. So you're, and back to the earlier thing. Yeah. I have the performance degrees, but you've got a lot of experience in this, and I kind of like publicizing rates too, because, yeah. um, well, anyway, it's, no, um, it's there's right. other stories there. Okay. I, I, I'm totally with you. And I think I w I'm in a very different place in my way of thought about it now, Robert, I'm, I'm really kind of coming over to your side more, but I do have, I mean, the, the community that I've created around here, I, I've, I've been told that people really appreciate my my rates and my flexibility and and the fact that i i so i i don't know i still feel i'm making enough money and um, i think if they appreciate our rate we're not charging enough i think if no i think if nobody ever quits because our rate is too high we're not quite charging enough i mean i don't like capitalism but it's what we got i mean th look at the people who are making tons of money okay <laughs> We're talking about I'll, I'll, I'll mute, I'm gonna mute my Come back. Come, Come back. Medicare for all or, or music for all. I don't know which one it is. MLT, MLT for, for all. all. MLT for all. And Sarah, I have to um, echo what Robert said, because um, I also may not have a piano performance degree. It's out there. Um, but we are experts in music learning theory. You are an expert yeah. in music learning theory. So you should not be charging, or you should not have that mindset that you should be charging any less because you are an amazing, right. amazing. I, don't, I shouldn't say that. I have a flute performance degree and a, and a master's in music ed. I'm, I'm, I know I'm, I'm doing well. I'm good. Yes. We're good. Absolutely. Um, and then Sarah, just quickly, what do you do for books? Uh, they're just an add on. So I tell them, Beginning of the year, you're going to spend roughly 50 bucks total in the year. Um, and I'll just add them on. If it goes above that, I will contact you first. Like, is this cool? This is going to bring you up to like 60 bucks total for the year. And like 100% of the time, the parents are like, whatever you think. So, Excellent. Um, and then Hannah, how do you handle tuition, um, discounts? I have a, a monthly... Yeah, um, I, I do a lot of similar things as what's already been said. I have a monthly fee. It's set January to December all the way through, um, and it doesn't change. And whether you take summer lessons or not, you still have to pay your summer month because it's um, reflected over the course of the year, not just month to month, because there's a different number of lessons in every month. And um, I offer discounts for upfront payments. I offer, um, and they're very minimal. Um, and the, you get a bigger discount if you pay the full year and you get a smaller discount if you pay by the semester or what I would call like half a year. And um, I have two rate, I have three rates. 
uh, I have a preschool rate for the preschool I teach is a little bit less because it's a group and it's, um, it's kind of like a fun line yop for me. Well, I do it for a reason, but that they, it's, but that's also a feeder into um, my studio. So once they get to my studio, because they're just not getting all the bells and whistles at preschool that they're getting in my studio. They're just not, it's not the same value. I mean, it is, but it's not. I'm the same teacher, but they're not getting everything else. But anyway, that's a side note. And then I charge um, a little bit more for just like two students. It's only two students. They are advanced high school students that are um, approaching graduation. and want to keep playing through college and, you know, probably going to audition at schools and things like that. So they, they come for an hour private lesson. And so they, they um, have to pay a little bit more, but for the most part, I just have the one rate that everybody pays and then some exceptions for uh, more expensive and less expensive. And then for books, everybody pays for their own books as far as the method is concerned. So um, that's all mapped out in the policy that um, young beginners are going to start in keyboard games and this is how much it costs. And then they're pretty quick, you know, they're going to eventually within the year, they're going to move to keyboard B depending on how quickly they go. And that's going to cost this much. And then, you know, it's all, the whole thing is mapped out right there and how much each thing costs as far as like supplemental repertoire books. I just include that in the tuition, but they know that they're going to be paying for tuition and books there. I don't charge a recital fee. That's all um, included. And um, event fees, we do a lot of events like uh, playing festivals and stuff like that. And that's just um, individual basis. If you want to participate in a particular event that has a registration fee, they pay that. Excellent. So we're wrapping up now. So I have a couple more questions. I'm going to do speed round. Um, so you can answer them quickly. So do you have a policy for what parents or caregivers do while the student is in the lesson? Hannah? Uh, yeah, they can stay in the car or they can sit in the lesson or they can sit in the waiting room and mess around on their phone or do work. Um, I have a lot of parents with younger siblings who go in the waiting room and there's some toys and stuff in there. It's very comfortable. Um, and there's even a uh, Clavinova with headphones. So like if somebody gets there early, they can go play. Um, but yeah, they need to be here. The younger ones, the, the, the older ones, the, the parents sometimes leave. But for the most part, it's kind of up to them uh, if they are have some helicopter parents who like to be everywhere all the time. And as long as they're not distracting or bothering, they just want to know. They want to see everything and they want to know. And then I have some parents who are like, have fun. I'm going in here. And they zone out on their phone. Um, and then I have some that wait in the car. That's about it. It's kind of up to the individual. Yeah. What's best for the kid is always, or what's best for the student is really my policy on that. Perfect. Robert, do you have a policy or is it kind of whatever? I they don't know. I mean, like I, I feel like I should. I feel like maybe community best practices, maybe it should be installed for teachers to have a parent around, around, not necessarily in the room, but adjacent. I don't have that. A lot of parents wait in the my living room, which is adjacent to the music studio. Some don't. I have a couple of kids that I teach alone. I find groups very helpful. Um, I, I think that's probably better for a lot of reasons. I, I don't know. It's something I think about. I, I don't have a written policy on that. And I kind of think maybe we should. I don't know. Yeah. Sarah, do you have a policy for what parents and caregivers do during the lesson? No, it's really similar to Hannah. There's a waiting room um, or they can go run their errands. Um, I make sure I have everybody's cell phone. So if they're, and I'm like, you know, don't, don't go too far or let me know if someone else is picking up your kid because if something does go wrong or like, I don't know, they vomit in class, then I need to have somebody <laughs> come deal with that. Um, but I will say that I'm, I'm expanding and I'm moving into a new space, hopefully next summer. And one of the things I'm considering doing is having um, a practice room that just enters by code, um, which I will rent out to the community. But for my family is, I thought of, especially with younger siblings, like if you want to go into the piano studio while your child is in here and, and play or, or look ahead, 
or play with your younger sibling and then we'll swap or even go in there right after their lesson and be like, hey, show me what you learned. This is some, this is kind of a new idea of mine is to keep the parents musical while their kid is, is in. I mean, you can't force somebody to be like, go make music. I wish someone would force me to. God, that'd be amazing. But, you know, I, as a parent, that would be cool. Like, you know, you can go in here and if you happen to want to make music, like I have a space for you to do that. Or if you want to take your three-year-old twins, Sarah, and go like mess around on the piano, I would think that's so incredibly valuable. So that's, that's something I'm working on, but that's money. Yeah. It's a lot of money, actually. <laughs> we'll talk later. <laughs> I'm going to totally go broke. <laughs> why, why don't we need to charge a lot? I mean, because, you yeah, know, like doctors <laughs> go to they pay for their educations and they get certified. We don't get certified, but I'm paying thousands of dollars for MLT training to get good. <laughs> true. That has, that has to go in the rate. That's true. Yeah. Well, my rates uh, are going up when I move studios. It ha they have to. Second speed round question. We'll make it even speedier. Um, yes, can, no. I go, can I go first? Because yeah. my piano tuner is going to be here in five minutes. Absolutely. We're going to cool. be here in five minutes. Sorry. Um, do you have your students' parents read and sign an agreement, or is it more informal? Sarah? More informal. I, would, I, I don't want to have it be too formal. It'll scare them away. But I do see the value in that. I think that would be really cool to have them kind of verbally or, or say, sign something. But no, I don't. Hannah? Uh, yeah, they have to initial and that's really just to like to make them read it because a lot of people just won't read it if they're not initialing as they go. Um, it's it, it's every question I've ever gotten answered and then they initial as they go and they sign at the bottom. But my implementation of it is relatively informal. <laughs> but it's there. So it's, it's important. It's, it's in it's writing. Yeah, it's in writing. <laughs> Robert, do you have any parents sign anything? They don't sign. I do have a policy and I send it often and I'll remind them of key points often to make sure everything's clicking, but nothing signs. All right. Currently. And then last question with regards to your studio policies. Um, what do you feel works really well? Um, and is there anything that you think can be improved or that you need to add or even from this discussion, do you think that there's something that you might need to add or are they perfect? <laughs> Hannah, what do you think? Um, I'm always thinking about this. I'm, I adjust my studio policy. I take a quick look over it every year and see if there's something that I want to change or if something went terribly, terribly wrong one year, I might make some changes. I think right now as it stands, it's pretty good the way it is. Um, it's working, but I, I tweak it every year. Yeah. yeah. Robert, what about you? Yeah. Right now things are clicking pretty good. Excellent. Sarah? I missed the question because my internet was unstable. Was it just, what, is there anything I change in my policies? Yeah. Or what do you think works really well? You know, I, I think I'm, I'm with the other two. It's, I, I think after years of doing this, it, it's clicking, but I did change, like I said, my weather policy after last year, after a bad weather. So that, that's kind of what does it, right? You have like, uh, you know, a, a family that does something that was really awful or they leave suddenly and you're like, oh crap, I have to revise this. So that, that's what it all is. It's you, what's working for me is, is what's working for me because I'm Sarah, I live in Minneapolis and these are the things that are working for me. So, um, but yeah, that's it. I don't know. I, I, it's clicking for me too. We're doing well. <laughs> that is wonderful. So I will not take up any more of your time. I want to thank Hannah, Robert and Sarah for joining me today and hopefully you all learned something, not you guys, but well, you could learn from each other. Um, sure. Everybody listening or watching has learned something um, about maybe something that they can do with their scheduling or maybe it's less intimidating, more intimidating um, and their studio policies as well. Thank you, Dreama, Andrea and Stephanie for joining us and adding to the discussion with your questions. Um, again, I don't think I ever introduced myself for those that didn't know me. Um, and I'm Chris Diadro. I'm with Music Learning Academy. Um, you can find more resources and um, videos and podcast episodes if you visit www.musiclearningacademy.com and also my keyboard games course that is almost complete that you can join um, with more webinars planned and more courses planned for the future. And I'm sure you'll see Hannah, Robert, and Sarah back um, for some more episodes as well. So thank you again. Thanks, Krista. Thank, thank you. you.